This talk is about the Pythagorean theorem for right angled triangles, one of the most remarkable results in mathematics with a wide range of applications. But what is this theorem? Where did it come from? And what has it to do with Pythagoras? Is it algebra or geometry? In what ways has it been proved? How can it be generalized? And what is Fermat's last theorem? As shown here, it tells us that for a right angled triangle, the area Z of the square on the longest side, the hypotenuse, is the sum of the areas X and Y of the squares on the other two sides. So it's a result from geometry. But if the triangle has sides of length A, B and C for the longest side, then these areas are A squared, B squared and C squared. And we can write the result in algebraic form as A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Although such an equation would have made no sense to Pythagoras or to his contemporaries. An example is the right angled triangle in the middle with size 1, 1, and the square root of 2, where 1 squared plus 1 squared equals the root of 2 squared, while two other examples shown below have size 3, 4, 5, with 3 squared plus 4 squared equals 9 plus 16 equals 25, which is 5 squared, and 5, 12, 13, with 5 squared plus 12 squared equals 13 squared. Who was Pythagoras? He was born around 570 BC on the Greek island of Samos, and later moved with his followers to Crotona, now in Italy. The Pythagoreans explored mathematical proof, but no evidence survives which links specific results to them or to Pythagoras himself. And so many historians prefer to say the Pythagorean theorem rather than Pythagoras' theorem. But although the Pythagoreans may have been the first to prove the theorem, the result had already been known in Mesopotamia a millennium earlier. The Mesopotamians, or Babylonians, wrote with a stylus on clay tablets, and many thousands of mathematical tablets have survived. Their number system was based not on 10, which we use, but on 60, which survives in our measurement of time, with 60 seconds in a minute and 60 minutes in an hour. This clay tablet from around 1700 BC shows a square with its diagonals, and the base 60 numbers 30 along the side of the square, and 42, 25, 35 at the bottom, and this is 30 times the square root of 2, the length of the diagonal. Their value for the square root of 2 appears across the middle as the base 60 number 1, 24, 51, 10, which means 1 plus 24 over 60 plus 51 over 60 squared plus 10 over 60 cubed, which in decimals is correct to an amazing five decimal places. The ancient Chinese were also familiar with the result, as illustrated by their broken bamboo problem shown here. A bamboo, 10 chi high, is broken, and the upper end reaches the ground 3 chi from the stem. Find the height of the break. To solve this with our algebraic notation, we let h be the height of the break. Then the longest side is 10 minus h, and the base of the triangle is 3. By the Pythagorean rule, h squared plus 3 squared equals 
10 minus h all squared. And multiplying out and solving this equation then gives the heights value to be 4 and 11 twentieths chi. There are actually hundreds of ways to prove the Pythagorean theorem, and we'll now look at three of these. Several civilizations have used dissection arguments to obtain the result. Here you can see two dissections of a square with side a plus b. And each of these dissections includes four right-angled triangles with sides a, b, and c. If we now remove these four triangles from the left-hand picture, we get two shaded squares with areas a squared and b squared. While removing them from the right-hand picture leaves a single shaded square with area c squared. Equating these two remaining areas then gives a squared plus b squared equals c squared, as we wanted. Our second proof is due to James Garfield, who later became the 20th President of the United States. It apparently came to him during a mathematical discussion with members of Congress. Garfield took two copies of the right-angled triangle with sides A, B and C. He placed them end to end and joined their top corners to form a trapezium with vertical sides of lengths b and a, and with base a plus b. The angle between the two sides of length c is then easily seen to be a right angle. Let's now calculate some areas. Now the area of any trapezium is the product of its base and its average height which here is a plus b, that's the base, times a half of a plus b, which is the average height. While the total area of the three triangles, each area being half of its base times its height, is one half a b plus one half c squared plus one half a b. If we now equate these areas and simplify the algebra, we then get a squared plus b squared equals c squared, as we wanted. In Euclid's classic Greek work, The Elements, from the 3rd century BC, Book 1 builds up to the Pythagorean theorem, and its proof is an impressive display of the style of geometrical arguments that permeates that seminal work. This proof is more complicated than the other two, but briefly the main ideas are as follows. In the diagram on the left, the vertical line down from A at the top of the triangle to the point L at the bottom splits the lower square into two rectangles. Using congruent triangles, as we've indicated on the right, Euclid proved that in the lower square, the left-hand rectangle has the same area as the upper left-hand square. And similarly, he showed that the right-hand rectangle has the same area as the upper right-hand square. It follows that the sum of the areas of the two upper squares is the same as the sum of the areas of the two rectangles which form the lower square. And this is the Pythagorean theorem. Here are two contrasting presentations of the Pythagorean theorem, both of them showing Euclid's proof. The first is taken from an Arabic text dating from the Middle Ages while the second appeared in a remarkable work of 1847 by Oliver Byrne, who used coloured diagrams and symbols instead of letters, he said, for the greater ease of learners. 
Earlier we saw two right-angled triangles, the lengths of whose sides were whole numbers. These were the triangles with size 3, 4 and 5, where 3 squared plus 4 squared equals 5 squared, and the triangle with size 5, 12 and 13, where 5 squared plus 12 squared equals 13 squared. Any whole number example can then be scaled up to give larger right-angled triangles with whole number sides. For example, if we double the lengths of the sides of the basic 3, 4, 5 triangle, we get the right-angled triangle with sides 6, 8, 10. Or if we scale up by a factor of 10, we get the right-angled triangle with sides 30, 40, 50. Notice that if we scale a right-angled triangle with sides a, b, and c by a factor of k to give one with size k, a, k, b, and k, c, then k, a squared plus k, b squared is equal to k squared times a squared plus b squared, which is just k squared times c squared or k, c squared. So the Pythagorean result still holds for the scaled up triangle. Is there a formula which always gives right angled triangles with whole number sides? The ancient Greeks had a way of doing so. If ABC is a basic right angled triangle, where A, B, and C are whole numbers with no common factors other than one, then they showed that we can write a equals s squared minus t squared, b equals 2st, and c equals s squared plus t squared, where the number s is greater than the number t, where s and t have no common factors, and where one of the numbers s and t is odd and the other is even. For example, if we take s to be 2 and t to be 1, we get a equals 2 squared minus 1, which is 3, b equals 2 times 2 times 1, which is 4, c equals 2 squared plus 1, which is 5, giving us the 3, 4, 5 right angle triangle. And similarly, if we take s to be 3, and t to be 2, then we get the 5, 12, 13 right angled triangle. Can we generalize the Pythagorean result on right angled triangles in the plane by extending it to three dimensions? On the right is a rectangular box with sides a, b, and c, and with a diagonal of length d. Applying the Pythagorean theorem to the bottom triangle ABE, we get a squared plus b squared equals e squared. Then applying it to the vertical triangle DCE gives e squared plus c squared equals d squared. Eliminating e squared now gives a squared plus b squared plus c squared equals d squared. And this is the three-dimensional Pythagorean theorem. For a cube with side 1, we have 1 squared plus 1 squared plus 1 squared is the square root of 3 all squared. So any diagonal of a cube has length root 3. An example with whole number lengths is 3 squared plus 4 squared plus 12 squared equals 13 squared. Here's a related puzzle concerning a spider and a fly. A spider is at a point A of a rectangular room with dimensions 30 by 12 by 12 feet, and a fly is at B. What is the shortest distance that the spider must crawl to catch the fly? One route is for the spider at A to descend to the floor 
that's 11 feet. Cross it, that's 30 feet. And then climb up to the fly at B, which is one foot, giving 42 feet in total. But can we do any better? Yes, we can, by flattening the room with the spider taking the direct route shown. Here, the total horizontal distance traveled is 32 feet, and the vertical distance traveled is 24 feet. By the Pythagorean theorem, these then give the spider's distance to be the square root of 32 squared plus 24 squared, which is the square root of 1600, or 40 feet, and this is the best solution. Finally, can we extend the Pythagorean theorem to higher powers? We found whole numbers where a squared plus b squared equals c squared. But can a cube be the sum of two other cubes? Or a fourth power be the sum of two other fourth powers? Such questions intrigued the 17th century French lawyer and mathematician Pierre de Fermat, shown above, who found a clever way of proving that there's no such result for fourth powers. He further claimed to have proved that for any whole number n larger than 2, the equation a to the n plus b to the n equals c to the n has no non-trivial whole number solutions, but few people believed his claim. And despite many attempts at a valid proof, no one else could do so either. And indeed, it wasn't until the 1990s that Andrew Wiles, a British mathematician working at Princeton University, announced to great excitement that he had proved Fermat's result in every case. And although a gap was found in his argument, it was soon patched up, and a 1,000-page proof was published in 1995. After more than three centuries, Fermat's so-called last theorem was finally proved. Thank you for listening.